must go to stand in for the shamed for the cause of his great name we must go we must go to go befriend the lost carriers of peace at all costs we must go to every corner
Hello and welcome to our online worship experience here at Satterbeck Berlin. My name is Tony and I'm the pastor here. And my name is Jessica and I'm the Saddleback Kids Director. We are so excited to be offering Saddleback Kids back in person here at our Berlin campus for early childhood age three through first grade and elementary school age kids from second grade through sixth grade. We could not be more thrilled to offer this kids church experience back live in person for the kids to grow and learn about Jesus and to connect with God and with other kids. Space is limited here at our location, so please go on our website, on our visit page, to register your kids for each Sunday. You can also find a lot of great resources on our website under kids to check out videos from our Hey Yo Jesus Bible stories to worship songs that are translated into German for you, and they're in English and Spanish as well. We also love kids, and if you love kids too, and maybe you don't want to serve directly in the classroom, but there are many serving opportunities, we'd love to talk more to you about Saddleback Kids. If you have any questions, please reach out to me through kids at saddleback.de and I'd love to connect with you further. I want to welcome you today to our online worship experience here at Saddleback Berlin. Um, and I don't know if you watch on our website right now or on YouTube. If you watch on YouTube, there are a couple of links in the video description that I ask you to check out. If you are watching on our website, I like to talk about some features that you can see in our watch experience. First of all, there is a notes button. For every sermon, we offer you uh, a section where you can put down some notes. There are the main Bible verses of the sermon, and you can use the save button to save all of your notes as a PDF on your computer. There is also a connect button on our watch experience, and I encourage you to check it out either right now or after the sermon, because this is our online connection card. And you can use it to just say hello and just mention that you were there. You can give us feedback on what you like and what you didn't like on our service. You can indicate that you like to talk to a leader of our church or you want to find out more. You can um, send prayer requests or ask any question you like. And you can also look for a small group. So click on connect and we would love to hear from you. We also have a gift button on our watch experience. And so if you feel part of our church, you can use the gift button to donate online. You can use PayPal or you can uh, just copy and paste the IBAN, our bank account details in there as well. If you are a first time visitor, if you're just a guest, please don't feel obligated to give. This is just for people who feel part of our church. There is also a share button in our watch experience. So if you like the sermon that you're about to hear and you think more people should hear it and maybe you have some specific people in mind, use the share button to, to forward this to anyone you like to um, forward it to. There are other things on our website that you can discover as well. There is an About Us page that talks about our story, about our values and about our church in general. You can also click on find a small group under connect um, and look for a small group in your area. Or you can check out our event calendar to see upcoming events to be part uh, of that as well. And so we would love to hear from you. And now we hope you enjoy our online service. And if you want to be here in person next week, check out the information on our visit subpage. Hey Saddleback family, welcome. We're so glad you guys are here. Let's stand as we worship and sing together.
We're gonna sing about the faithfulness of God today. So bring your worries, bring your shame, and sing of his faithfulness. When did I start to forget all of the great things you did? When did I throw away faith for the impossible? How did I start to believe you weren't sufficient for me? Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? You are more than able. You are more than able. You are more than able. 
how you work there's so much goodness in grace much more than I deserve cause I know who I am I can't stay where I'm at we've come this far by faith and I just can't turn back. He's not done with me yet. He's not done with me yet. And he's not done with you. But there's so much more to the story. You're not done with me.
God is most high and worthy of our praise today. He is kind, loving, gracious, and more than enough for every need that we have. And so when we join together and we worship him and we declare his greatness, we're joining with all of creation. We're joining with the trees of the forest, with the mountains, with the rocks. The scripture says that if we don't praise him, the rocks will cry out his greatness. He is high and lifted up and your soul was created to worship him. There's nothing in this world that will satisfy you like him. And so today we declare with our lips and our hearts that he is great, his greatness. So let's lift our praise. Father, we thank you. King Jesus, we honor you in this church. We declare you are the one who's worthy of praise. Thank you, Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world, who took our sins and nailed them to a cross. You are high and lifted up. You are alive today, King Jesus. And with our lips, we declare your praise. I pray that you would minister to us today as we look at your word, as we, we open our hearts and our minds to you today, that you would change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. You may grab a seat. Let's thank the choir for leading us today. Great job, guys. Welcome those of you who are joining us online, those of you at our campuses those of you at all of our extensions, 40 extensions all over the world today. We're beginning a new message series. It's called Transferring Trust. And for the next four weeks, we're gonna talk about a very important subject, the subject of trust. But before I get into today's message, I wanna take just a moment to celebrate some of the exciting things that God is doing in our church. Uh, when you look back over the last 40 years, God's been so faithful to Saddleback. He's changed so many lives over these 43 years of our ministry. And today we're celebrating what he's doing all over the world through uh, extensions and missions and lives that Jesus is changing. And one of the most important components of our vision is our church being one church in multiple locations all over the world. In fact, uh, our dream is to continue to start other campuses in places internationally, in other places in Southern California, primarily because we want to reach more people with the love of Jesus. We want to have more campuses and more locations to reach more people with the good news of Jesus. And uh, last year, as we started praying through new locations, we had a conversation with a couple who is pastoring a church in Whittier, David and Renette Mills. They pastor Faith Community Church, and they were getting close to their uh, transition to retirement, and they approached Saddleback and they said, hey, um, we love Saddleback, we've been to purpose-driven conferences, we're so excited about what God is doing in this generation through Saddleback. We wonder if you would bring us into the family of Saddleback and then launch us back out as a campus of Saddleback. And so we started praying with their elders, with our elders, and long story short, over a period of several months, together, um, it was clear God was in this conversation, and last week, their church got together, they voted to become a part of the Saddleback family of campuses, and so we will launch them out um, as our 19th physical location in the fall of 2023, which is incredible. This also ties in, uh, that's not the only good news I want to share with you, um, our Hong Kong campus, as they've been growing, they've been sending people all over the world. People are moving to cities like Vancouver and Manchester. They started extensions in those cities, and those extensions started to grow and uh, became larger and larger. Some of uh, those extensions started to grow to over 50 people. And as we started praying through uh, with the leaders of those locations, it became very clear that God was in that as well to launch our Vancouver and our Manchester UK extensions as new campuses of Saddleback Church. So this fall, we will be launching three brand new locations in Whittier, in Manchester, and in Vancouver. And we're so thrilled about that. Now it's important to know, this is like a bold step for us as a church. We've stepped into many bold moments as a church throughout our history. We've got like three months to launch these campuses which means that it's gonna take people, families moving to these communities. If you know somebody in one of these areas, uh, people praying diligently, and we wanna invite you, number one, to be praying for these campuses, 
but God's gonna stir in some of your hearts to move, to help start. Some of you maybe for a season would be a part of the launch team. It's gonna be awesome to watch lives that are gonna ch change through it, but it's gonna take us stepping up in faith. So today, when you take your next steps, there's a button that you can click on on our digital program that says New Campuses, and we'd love to get you connected into one of those new campuses. But before we move on, can we just take one more moment to celebrate all that God is doing? Now, today as we launch into this new series, I, I wanna begin talking about the subject of trust through the angle of the fact that every single one of us are creatures of trust. In fact, in your notes, I wanna invite you to pull them out. The first point that I have there in terms of shaping our thinking around trust is this. Trust is the currency of life. It's how we relate to one another. It's how we move about life. You trusted traffic this week when you were going to work. You're trusting the chair that you're sitting in. I trust traffic more than Stacy trusts traffic. Um, if you were to ask her how far we live from the Lake Forest campus, I would say 10 minutes, she would say 15 minutes. And most of the time, she's right, unless I'm driving, and then it's 10 minutes. <laughs> but we're all constantly trusting. We're trusting in our jobs, we're trusting in people, we're trusting in the chair you're seated, seated in right now. Trust is the currency of life. Now, the more I understand trust, the more I can understand, do I give trust to the right thing or the wrong thing? But it's good to understand or define what trust is. So in your notes, the first component I put here is that trust, trust is active surrender. So again, if you are seated right now, some of you maybe you're listening online and you're walking with your phone, but if you're seated right now, you are trusting the chair that you're in. And your, your bum or your bottom is in the chair. And hopefully you're fully in the chair, like it's enough space for you. And that trust that you've placed in the chair, you are fully in that chair. Maybe you're sitting on the edge of it and it's rocking and that's not good, it will fall over. But when you're seated fully, it's an active surrender into that object. Trust is active surrender. It's putting your faith in an object. But when it comes to our faith journey, I want you to hear this, trust spiritually is trusting not just in an object, but it's trusting in God himself. So it's active surrender in the goodness of God. And not only the goodness of God, but the reliability of God's goodness. So what I wanna do over these next four weeks that we have together is I want to do the best I can to convince you of the goodness of God, that he is reliable, that he can be trusted to greater degrees with your life. Now, when it comes to trust, if I want to know what I'm trusting in, the greatest evidence or test of what I trust in is how I handle my earthly treasures. So the way that I handle the possessions that God placed into my hands, my time, my talent, and ultimately my earthly treasures, money, houses, clothes, the objects that I seemingly own, what I do with them shows me what I trust in. Jesus made this statement. He said in Matthew chapter six, verse 19, he says this, he uh, excuse me, just a moment here. He says in Matthew six, 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth, moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I want you in your notes just to underline that line that says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if I want to know what I trust in, look at where I place my treasure, where I place my money, the things that I own that shows me what I'm trusting in. Now what I'd like to do for these four weeks that we have together is I want to focus on our money in terms of what we're trusting in with our finances. If I wanna know my value system, I look at where my money is going. And I'll say this, when it comes to the subject of generosity, giving money, I've preached or talked about money a whole lot in 20 years of ministry. But I'm new to Saddleback, I've been here less than a year. And I really like you guys. I thought you might wanna know that. I actually really, really love what God is doing in this church and built so many great relationships in a very short period of time. And I'll be honest, I want you to like me too. I do. But sometimes when you talk about money, people get funny. People get a little odd when you talk about money because sometimes 
we can start to think that, well, when we talk about money, it's all about what the church or what the pastor wants from me. And I, I don't want you to be confused about my motive these next four weeks. I want you to know that this whole series is gonna be about God's word, number one. It's gonna be about what God's done in our lives for Stacy and I on our journey of generosity. And I want you, I want our church, we want to experience the fullness of freedom that comes when I trust God first with my generosity, with my possessions. And I'm gonna invite you, this series is an invitation to transfer trust fully to God, to experience the joy and the freedom that comes from that. So if it's okay that I would be vulnerable with you to just say, you can pray for me. Pray that God would give me courage as I talk about this subject and know that this is a, this is a heart, a love for you to talk about what Jesus cares about. When you study the Bible, Jesus actually talks more about money than heaven and hell combined and half of the parables of Jesus are about the subject of money. And so we're gonna look at his words and we're gonna be encouraged from God's word as we journey together. Now today, I wanna to go to a story in the Old Testament, and it's a story of Elijah. And we're gonna look at this journey that Elijah goes on and see the faithfulness of God to Elijah. Now it's good to know, when we look at Elijah's story in 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah is in the middle of a very significant season for the people of God. The Israelites had been disobedient to God. And Ahab is this wicked king. Now he is worshiping false gods. He, he's married a woman by the name of Jezebel. He's turned against God. And Elijah is the prophet that God calls to preach to Ahab. And the very first message that Elijah gives to Ahab is one where Elijah tells Ahab that there's gonna be a drought for three and a half years. How would you like for that to be your first sermon as a preacher? You're gonna to go to the king and you're gonna tell him he's a sinner and there's gonna be a drought for three and a half years. Strong start. That's like, thank you for this sermon, Elijah. So Elijah goes in 1 Kings chapter 17. I want you to see these words. It says, now Elijah, who is from Tishbe and Gilead, told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. And then the Lord said to Elijah, so there's gonna be a drought and God's gonna give a word to Elijah in the middle of the drought. And he says this, go to the east and hide by the Kareth brook near where it enters into the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you for I have commanded them to bring you food. Now sometimes we read the Bible and maybe you're just listening to a sermon and you're like, okay, this is awesome, thank you. Um, I'm reading the Bible, yeah, nod in my head. But then you stop and you're like, okay, wait a second. This just said that God told Elijah to go to the middle of the desert and he's gonna feed him with ravens. It's like, I thought people feed birds, not birds feed people. It's like, it's a little bit weird. It's out of order here. But God is going to do something so powerful in this story to make a point to Elijah that he is Elijah's provider. And there are two things God is doing in this passage. One, God is protecting Elijah and two, God is providing for him. In fact, I want you to write this down in your notes. There's no blank for it, so don't freak out. Um, but just, just write down, he's a protector and he's a provider. God is a loving father. And the same God who treats Elijah with such tenderness and care is the same God that is able to protect and provide in any season of our life. He's a faithful pro provider. He's a faithful protector. And for Elijah, Elijah is gonna go into the wilderness and camp by a brook, and for a period of time, God is going to feed Elijah with ravens through food, bringing them the food to him during the morning and night. He's gonna take care of Elijah with his sustenance through this brook in the middle of a drought. Now, um, I like sometimes to watch YouTube videos, and sometimes because of my ADHD brain, I can get distracted down a rabbit trail with videos, and I've gotten lost on videos about ravens many times. They are a fascinating bird. They actually are smarter, many people believe, than seven-year-old kids. Depends on the seven-year-old kid, of course. But they're very smart birds. They travel in families of like five. They can be trained. I actually watched, this is a little a tangent, but it's interesting. Um, I saw this video about these ravens in Australia, 
and they picked these nuts. They would take the nut from the tree. When they were at a stoplight, they would put the nut underneath the car that was stopped at the red light. The car would pass over the nut, break the nut, then the raven would fly down and get the nut. Is that not crazy? So God's smart. Like God strategically chooses a raven, not a dodo. Like he's gonna, he's gonna feed Elijah through a raven. Now watch this as it unfolds. It says, so Elijah did as the Lord told him, camp beside the Kareth Brook, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. So in the middle of a drought, Elijah is being taken care of by God. It's like no water in the land, no food in the land, but God is still faithfully providing for every need that Elijah has. And this is so important for us to understand that no matter what our circumstances are, God is never limited by our circumstances. So whatever it is that you and I lack, God is always able, he is more than able to provide for any need in any season that we have. And sometimes in our journey spiritually, what can happen in terms of provision is we can get our eyes so focused on the stream of God's provision for our lives. See, there's a difference between the source and the stream. There's a stream that God is going to use to provide for every need that Elijah has, and there's a source. It's kind of like this cool illustration. I'm so grateful for our team here at Saddleback that worked so hard to keep up with my weird, crazy illustration ideas. And sometimes it's last minute, and this was one of them, but they, they made it happen. Now, imagine for just a moment, here is this object, and I'm... That was awesome. They do a great job with it too. And um, can thank them for making this. I love this water here, it's a little brown. Um, so we won't drink it. But when I pump it, it works. You know, this is a stream. I can feel it going down my, I got a stream all over me now. Um, but this is the stream that's coming and every time I pump, it comes. But I can actually turn this off. And when I turn it off, I can pump and eventually the stream dries out. Now, it's important to distinguish or to separate the difference. See, I'm pumping, there's no stream, but underneath, there's still a source. And what can happen is sometimes I can get my eyes so focused on the stream of provision over the source of provision. So the stream of provision is your company that God will use for a period of time. Most of us will have a lot of different jobs throughout the course of our life. If you look back some of you who are students, you have, you're like on job number two, but eventually you're gonna have the 15th company that you work for, and maybe you'll go from company to company, and it's easy in the midst of that to look at the stream of provision and put your hope or your trust in the stream rather than the source, but at some point, the stream dries up. So a part of living with trust, a part of experiencing God's peace is to separate the source of provision from the stream of provision to separate in our minds the source of provision from the stream of provision. The source of provision is where it comes from. The stream of provision is what it comes through. The source is ultimately underneath the stream, providing for everything that the stream delivers. So when you think about income and economics, you've probably heard this phrase, multiple streams of income. People will talk about rich dad, poor dad. The book talks about multiple streams of income, but sometimes the stream of income dries up. You lose your job, the, the economy struggles, there's inflation, the stream dries up. And if we're thinking about the stream as the, the provider for our lives, if the, the two of them are enmeshed, what will happen is we will start to live with fear and anxiety and not realize that in the middle of a drought, there is still a source that is able to provide for every single need that we have. So in the middle of a recession, in the middle of inflation, in the middle of any challenge that we face, God is still able to provide every need that we have. So come back to this passage. It says, so sometime later in verse seven, after a while, the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Sometime later, there was a moment where the provision was different. It wasn't coming through the same stream anymore, 
but the source was not gone. And I wanna encourage you today to begin to look at your life through these two angles to say, what is the stream of provision and what is the source of provision? The source ultimately is the God of unlimited resources who is not limited by our circumstances. So our perspective oftentimes becomes one that is so restricted by what we can see in front of us to not realize that there's a God of abundance who stands outside of circumstance that in any moment of our life is able to provide for any need that we have. So Elijah, the brook is going to dry up. So the brook dries up. And watch what Elijah does in verse number eight. It says, so after the brook dried up, the Lord then said to Elijah, now go live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon, for I have instructed a widow there to feed you. Now in our culture in the United States of America or even globally in modern day, um, it's very different than back when Elijah lived thousands and thousands of years ago. Back then, a widow was basically, it was a death sentence from a provision standpoint. You, you, if you didn't have a family member that could provide for you, you, you were in big trouble. And here is this widow, and God says, okay, I'm gonna take you from a brook or a stream in the wilderness, and I'm gonna move you over to a widow to provide for your needs, which is like, this just does not, it's almost, it's almost as crazy as using a raven to feed me. And God says, I'm gonna take you over to this widow and I'm gonna provide for you over here in this town outside of Israel. So this is not even a Jewish woman who shares the same faith that Elijah shares. And Elijah number two, I want you to see that Elijah pays attention to the source over the stream. So the stream dries up, but the source says, I've got a new stream that I'm gonna provide for you through. Go over here to this town with this widow, and I'm gonna take care of your needs. So he went there. And it says, as he arrived at the gates village, he saw a widow gathering sticks and he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? And as she was going to get it, he called to her, bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug I was just gathering a few st sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. And in this moment, this, this woman does not feel like she has the ability to provide for Elijah. She's out of resources herself. Elijah's out of resources. And it kind of reminds me of a time back in 2020 when we started running out of resources and there was no more toilet paper. Anybody remember this back in 2020? I don't know if this is true internationally, but here in the United States of America, there was a toilet paper shortage. And some of you still have toilet paper at your house that you bought in 2020. God bless you. You're the one that took it all. And if you'll remember, there was like this massive line outside of Costco and grocery stores, and it's like you get a roll of toilet paper. And there was a shortage. There was a shortage. The stream of toilet paper dried up. Thank God we still had showers. Some of you get that later. But the stream and the source, when I complicate them and put them together in my mind, I get so confused. If you pay attention to the shortage, if you pay attention to the stream, you and I end up living with so much fear and so much anxiety. But God, in the midst of this, is trying to teach both Elijah and the widow in the story about his faithfulness and his ability to provide in any circumstance in both of their lives. And God says to Elijah, go to this woman, tell her to provide, he tells her, and then she says, I don't have anything left. But Elijah, verse 13, says to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but first, make a little bread for me, and then use what's left to prepare a meal for you and your son, for this is what the Lord says, the God of Israel, there will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers. If you put God first, if you trust God first, there will always be olive oil, there will always be flour in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. And what Elijah is telling her is to put God first as the source of everything. 
And this woman, she doesn't trust God yet. She doesn't believe in the same God that Elijah believes in. And there's a powerful principle at place. I have watched so many people come to trust in God as God by first starting to trust him with their resources. Because when I put my trust in God first, there's a powerful principle at play in God's economy that when I put him first in my finances, God does things in my finances that I would never experience without trusting in him first. And Elijah says to this woman, he says to her in verse 15, I want you to see it, see it here. So she did as Elijah said, she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Just as the Lord had promised, he continued to meet the widow's need and he continued to meet Elijah's need. And God is inviting us to trust him. He makes so many promises when it comes to our trusting in him with our finances. And I want you to see just three of these promises that God makes. The first one, God promises that he will take care of all of my needs when I trust in him first. In Philippians chapter four, verse 19, the apostle Paul says this, he says, this same God who takes care of me, and he writes this from a prison cell, the same God that is providing for me in a prison, the same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches. He is a source of life. He is a source of provision that is not limited by your circumstances. He will provide for all of your needs which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. And this reminds me of so many moments from our journey where we were seemingly so limited in our resources. When Stacy and I first got married just over 20 years ago, we lived in Fort Worth, Texas, and we were going to seminary. And when we went to seminary, we had limited resources in terms of being able to pay our bills. But we were committed to not taking out student loans to get through grad school, so we knew it's gonna be a stretch for us. But at the same time, we were so committed to trusting God first with our finances. And we said, we're always gonna put you first, God, no matter what our circumstances are. We had a sum of money that we had in a bank account that family and friends had given to us as gifts for our, our wedding and we were living on that plus our 20 hour a week minimum wage jobs. And we were watching throughout the course of the semester that amount of money go down, 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 down. And there are some moments where you're like, okay, well, if I keep trusting you, what's gonna happen? Am I gonna be able to pay my bills at the end? And I so clearly remember it was the end of the semester. There was just a little bit of money left in the account, but we're still trusting God first. Stacy walks out to the mailbox, and she gets a letter from Ashley Jett. Ashley, Stacy's college roommate, wrote this letter saying, God put it on my heart to send you this money, and the amount of money was exactly the amount of money that we needed to pay our bill in that moment. It was like God wanted us to see, I got you. I got you. I see you. I know you're trusting me. I'm, I'm faithful. I can provide in a desert. I can provide in a drought. I can provide when you don't have anything. I'm, I am not the God of limited resources. I am the God of unlimited resources for every need that you have. So for a widow, for a prophet in the wilderness, I have been faithful and I will continue to care for you. Not only is he able to meet every need, but he's also able to abundantly bless me when I put him first in my finances. Jesus, these are his words right here. He says, give and you will receive. Now this is talking about giving, financial giving. Trust me with your generosity. Trust me with your giving. You will, your gift will return to you in full. Pressed down, Jesus says, shaken together to make room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. The measure or the amount you give will de determine the amount that you give back. Now, this is not like a cosmic genie. You just rub God on the belly, and you're like, oh, well, I give, and he gives back. It's, it's a principle that God is inviting me to trust him as the provider for my life, and when I trust him, he, he abundantly blesses. He does things outside of my economics when I trust him. 
Stacy and I, before coming to Saddleback, we pastored for 14 years in the Bay Area, and I always feel like when I would talk on money and invite the church to give generously and trust God that we needed to go first. And there were moments where we would step into capital campaigns and multiple year initiatives. And at the same time, when we moved to the San Francisco Bay Area back in 2008, we sold the house that we lived in in Texas and we, we kind of gave up on the dream of ever owning a home in California. We're like, it's too expensive but we'll save up and we'll try. So we'd save up some money and then we would go into a capital campaign. And we would sense this internal stirring from God to take what we had saved up for our house, this happened to us twice, and to give it towards what we believe God was calling us to trust him with, with the church. And there were moments, again, in, in the releasing that it was like we, we might never own a home, but we're gonna trust you. In 2015, there was a mission agency that was investing in church planters and called Stacy and I and said, hey, we found and selected a few church planters that we wanna buy a home for. We're gonna buy the home, let you live in the home for several years, save up money, and then at the end of it, we're gonna sell you the home for the exact same amount of money that we bought the home for. We, we want to do this with you. And it was, it was like God wanted us to realize every time you, you took that money and you put it into my kingdom, it's like you, you can't give him something that he didn't give you first. And you, you can't outgive God. So there's, there's so many moments in our lives where we're, we're, we're so restrictive and we're holding on and God is wanting to bless us abundantly he's wanting to give us stories to tell our kids and our grandkids of his faithfulness that when I trust him with my giving he is able he is more than able to bless me abundantly don't you want more of those stories in your life don't you want to be able to tell your grandkids about those moments where only God could have come through for you and for me the more that we trust him he abundantly blesses. Not only does he do this, but he also is able to multiply what I give to him. In 2 Corinthians chapter nine, uh, verse number 10, it says, God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase our resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous, and when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So what God wants to do is he wants to put into your hands and my hands, he wants to bless so that we can take what he puts in our hands and bless others. And God knows if he can get it through me, he'll get it to me. If he can get it through you, he'll get it to you. So when my hand is open like this, he multiplies what's in my hand so that I can bless other people. Friends, I have watched this over and over and over again. It doesn't matter your business acumen, how awesome you are in your career. If you are a generous person, God will find you and he will bless you so that you can be a blessing to other people. It is the economics of God that he is a good father that is wanting to bless his world, to bless his kids. And when he finds kids that live open-handedly, he blesses them so that they can bless more people. We had another instance with this where we had a friend who's walking through a circumstance. God gave me a certain number he wanted me to give to that person. I gave a check to that friend. I'm not gonna say the amount because it gets weird when you start saying amounts. But the very next day in the mail, somebody sent me a check for more than I had just sent. I have so many stories like this of God's faithfulness. And it's not always about a certain amount of money, it's about what God is doing in our hearts the more that we trust him. I have watched so many people on their journey of generosity where if you think about the habits that we build, like I've watched people start eating health, healthy and then go back. I've watched people start reading their Bible on a daily basis and then struggle to continue with that habit. Anecdotally, I've watched so few people that have gone on a journey of generosity and turned back. Because there's something about the joy that you experience the more you, the more we trust God, and the more we see his faithfulness, the more we want to trust him. He is a 
faithful provider. I wish there was somebody that was with me that would say amen. Maybe I need to start amening myself. <laughs> that he is a faithful provider for every need that you have. Now I'm gonna finish with this verse, Malachi chapter three, verse eight through 11. This is an Old Testament verse, and this is a promise from God. It's another one of his promises to bless you. And this is a teaching about the concept of tithing and trusting God first with our tithe. And it says, is it right to rob God, yet you are robbing me, says the Lord, but you ask, how are we robbing you? And God says to the people of Israel, by not returning your tithe and your offering, so bring your whole tithe into the storehouse and test me in this. See if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room for you to store it, and then I will prevent the pest from devouring your crops. God is saying, if you will put me first in your finances, I will take care of, I will provide, but you have to trust me. This is the only place in the Bible where God invites us to test him. And I've just watched so many people test God and see his faithfulness over and over and over again. Now it's a journey, right? It starts, and there are different types of giving in our lives. It starts with occasional giving. This is in your notes. It starts with people who occasionally trust God. This is also known as people who tip God. It's like great sermon, there's a tip, God. Great worship, there's a tip, God. Um, it kind of reminds me of one time I sent Stacy and the boys on a date. I gave my sons the credit card, or I should say debit card. I gave them the debit card, and they went out to eat. I said, just pay for it, um, treat mom to dinner, show her what it, it's like to be a gentleman. And Stacy looks down at the bill after they've eaten at Olive Garden, and she looks at the tip, and uh, apparently I didn't have a good discussion about tips, because one of my sons thought, based upon maybe Starbucks or something, you tip a dollar or two dollars. So they had eaten this whole meal, and there was a two dollar tip to the, the waitress. And Stacy said, that's, that's not good, let me take that. The point is, sometimes that's how we treat God. We're, we're, we're just tipping him. Now, what happens is we move towards regular giving after this occasional giving. And you don't have to go through this journey. You can go straight towards trusting God with your tithing. But there's something about when I trust God as occasionally, then I move towards regular giving. We call this a dipper. So we go from a tipper to a dipper. And this is like I'm dipping my toe in the journey of generosity. And then once I'm there, a lot of people then take this step to do what the scripture teach. That's proportional giving. And we call that a chipper. This is somebody who's happy because they're experiencing the joy of the Lord as they trust God first with their generosity. Then once I trust God with my generosity, I've seen in my own life, this makes me want to trust him at a deeper level. And we call this strategic giving beyond the tithe, and I call that a bricker. You like how all these rhyme? This is what I do in my free time. I rhyme. You can thank me later. So, AKA brickers, because they're building. They're building the kingdom of God. And then finally, sacrificial givers, AKA rivers, that I'm just trusting in God with my whole heart as this river to build his kingdom to make a difference. That's where God wants to lead us to this spirit led by the Holy Spirit, trusting he puts in my hands so that he can use me to bless those around me. I've watched it over and over and over again. And there's a couple in our church, Chris and Taylor, and I want you to hear their story of how they've gone on a journey of generosity and how God's blessed it. Let's watch this together. Going into our marriage, I had my own separate accounts, my own credit card, and she had her separate accounts with her mom. And I was craving to be connected in this area, but at the same time, I was also not caring about whatever debt I was getting into, not caring about how I was making it. Um, several of my clients were, were criminals. I, I just, I didn't care how I got it. I wanted more of it. and. God had to use everything at his disposal to get our attention. Um, I was sued for a six-figure lawsuit for wrongful business practices. I was accused of fraud, criminal negligence, and frankly, I did exactly what they were accusing me of. 
the moment when he told me about the lawsuit, everything changed. And I, I don't know, I think I had sort of like, kind of like that moment in my head of like, we're gonna get on our knees and we're gonna pray. God, like, we don't know what you're gonna do with this. Like, why we don't know what kind of outcome, we don't know how we're gonna survive this. We are lost, help us. Pastor Rick did a, did a, a, a series on giving. And he, he talked about, God doesn't need your money. God, God wants your heart. God um, wants to bless you, but you, you, you need to take the first step. And that was, that was it, you know? It's, it, it was like, okay, you know, we're gonna do this. I watched him do it. I wasn't doing it. It took me a while to follow, actually. I was quite stubborn because I had, I had put God as a budget line item. Ultimately, God rang the bell so loudly, like, Taylor, Taylor, you're my kid. I got you. It's okay. I'm always going to have you. And surrendering my tithe and returning my tithe and trusting and putting my trust in God for my business and our finances is is a really healing and powerful thing for me. And us being able to come together, putting our income into an account and, and, and setting a budget, it was like we finally got married for the first time, where our souls came together and we became one. With a lawsuit. We will be handing them... Well, the last payment in September, in September this year. September this year. We paid it off. And we might have a little, a little party. Not a big party, a little party. Just a small one. Making that choice and making that posture change and allowing God to be the, the, the trustee over everything, um, it bears fruit. I want, I want to invite you to trust God more than you trust him right now. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt as we look at stories in the Bible and as we share stories with one another that there, there is so much more of God to be experienced as we trust in him with our whole heart, with everything that we have. In fact, what I want to invite you to do is I want to invite you to go on a journey that we're going to call the Trust Challenge. And for the next 90 days, I wanna invite you to trust God completely with your giving, with your generosity. And as we talk today about that journey to take the next step, some of you, the step for you is today to begin to trust God for the first time with a tithe. You've never put God first in your finances and to make a commitment to say, God, I wanna trust you with my tithe. Some of you, it's, you've been tithing for maybe even decades and it's grown old and stale and it's like this religious experience and th there's no joy in it and God is saying, I'm inviting you to move beyond that to trust me at a deeper level. Others of you, maybe this is the first time for you to ever step forward to begin to trust God. Stacy and I, over the next 90 days, are gonna go on a journey with you and we're gonna take a step in our generosity to trust God more and we wanna invite you to test God, as Malachi said, and to see the faithfulness of God. In fact, today, um, as you're taking your next steps on the bottom of your notes, there's a little QR code there that you can scan, so as you pull out your little camera app and you scan over that, that will take you directly to the place where you can take your next steps today. And on our digital program, you'll see a place that says, I wanna take the trust challenge. I want to invite you to take that step. And as you do, we'll send you resources. Our team actually put together an ebook that will help you, that will walk along, alongside of you, just to really just resource you in the journey over the next 90 days. I'd love to know if you're going to take this step to journey alongside of us, to trust God at a greater degree so that I can be praying for you over these next 90 days. And as you lean in, and as you decide, do I want to fully trust God with this area of my life? I wanna tell you a quick story. Stacy and I, we celebrated 20 years of marriage just a, a week and a half ago. We had, um, yeah, you're clapping for her. She, she hung in there with me for 20 years. It was easy for me, um, but hard for her. Joking aside, 
Um, when, when I met Stacy in college and started dating, um, I, I was like, financially, we were broke, but I, I knew I needed to get a ring and put a ring on this girl's finger. And I remember walking into a jeweler, jeweler and literally taking everything that was in my bank account and saying, I will empty out the whole thing to buy a ring to put on this girl's finger. And there's never been a moment in my life where I have regretted the decision to fully go all in and to sacrifice because when you love and you experience that deep love inside your heart, sacrifice comes from within. Trust comes from within. And the invitation to trust God at a deeper level is an invitation to love him, to follow him, to obey him from within your heart, to experience the joy of a journey of generosity. And there are some of you that you've been living on the fence in your journey with God, maybe even doing life and even your finances your own way. And why not, just for a short period of your life, if it doesn't work for three months, go back to the way that you were doing it before. But I am certain from my own journey and the faithfulness of God and scripture, he is trustworthy and faithful and is able to be trusted with anything that you place into his hands, anything that we give back to him is something that he's given to us first. And I wanna invite you to fully trust him today. As we pray now, in just a moment, your campus pastor will come up and lead you through a response and next steps. But I wanna invite you right now just to say yes to God. Just say, God, I, I wanna trust you more. I wanna trust you with my heart, with my mind. I wanna trust you with my finances. And I wanna honor you. And God, we do thank you that as we go on a journey of generosity, you prove yourself faithful over and over again. Help us to trust you more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Church, would you stand with us one more time?
We love you, church. See you guys next weekend.